So why don't uh, I open us in, in prayer? Father, uh, what a blessing it is to uh, gather together with uh, your saints uh, here at Believer's Chapel. Uh, we marvel at the grace that you have uh, poured upon this church, uh, upon her people, and um, here we are again, uh, look out, and uh, there they all are. They've come again. Uh, some can't come. Uh, they're at home or in the hospital, and we pray for them today, and we pray for others who face things in their lives this week and the next that are very serious to them and important to them, and we pray your blessings uh, upon each of us. Uh, Father, we're grateful for your word. Uh, we're here right now to open it, read it, think about it, uh, be instructed by you, and so we pray that you would bless uh, the ministry of the word here at Believer's Chapel today, bless this class, uh, bless the other classes that are meeting, uh, bless uh, the ministry of the word uh, later, and uh, uh, the observance of the sacraments of the New Testament church. We get to do both today, so we pray your blessings upon those. And now, Lord, as we look at this wonderful passage that we cannot do justice to, but you can in our hearts, we pray your blessings upon our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. So please turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 26 through 38. We're following the historian Luke's outline, which he promised to Theophilus in his preface would be written out in consecutive order. So uh, in our last lesson, we read of how God in grace announced the miraculous conception of John the Baptist to the aged and barren Elizabeth and Zacharias, uh, their son would be great, the angel Gabriel said, and he would be the forerunner to the Messiah prophesied from ages past. And now beginning in verse 26 of chapter 1, he advances his account six months forward to, in order to chronicle an even greater announcement, uh, notably shifting the scene from Jerusalem with its glorious temple and storied past to the backwater town of Nazareth, an obscure village not even mentioned in the Old Testament and nestled between the port cities of Tyre and Sidon, inhabited more by Gentiles than by Jews, and so little regarded that the matter of fact Nathaniel would later remark, can anything good come out of Nazareth. Yet this would be the scene of the spiritually touching and theologically profound encounter between Gabriel again and a humble and pious teenage virgin who would be the mother of the Christ. I'm hot and I'm going to take this jacket off. Are you hot? Thank you. So we read, beginning in verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, 
and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. One of the major themes in the Bible is the propensity of the Lord God to choose the humble of this world to accomplish his greatest works, uh, shunning the very human propensity to select the brightest and the best. Uh, Zacharias had been a simple country preacher, a priest forgotten by history were it not for God's intervention in his life. And now we come to Mary, who would become the mother of the Savior of the world, but who, before the incident we just read, was only one of a multitude of faceless young Jewish girls inhabiting the Roman-occupied region of Palestine, having reached the age of engagement, but not yet marriage, Kent Hughes observed from all indicators, her life would not be extraordinary. She would marry humbly, give birth to numerous poor children, never travel farther than a few miles from home, and one day die like thousands of others before her, a nobody in a nothing town in the middle of nowhere. But God, as the Apostle Paul would later insist, delights in working his inscrutable will and in performing his marvelous, remar remarkable wonders through the humblest of actors so that all the glory will belong to him alone. What may appear to be foolishness with God is wiser than any man, and that which might appear is weakness in God is stronger than the strongest of men. God has chosen the foolish things of the world, Paul wrote, to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despise God has chosen, the things that are not, nobody's so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man or woman may boast before God. The Mary to whom we are introduced in this very familiar passage was by every human measure a nobody. And yet she would forever be remembered as an emblem of the grace of God revealed in the incarnation of his son. The grace, favor, and blessing she receives from the Lord will be all wrapped up in him. Well, the angel Gabriel, it seems, was clearly on a mission as he had been sent to Zechariah, so he was sent by God specifically to this young girl who would have otherwise been destined for anonymity. Her name was a common name. We know that, of course, by our knowledge of these gospel accounts. In his earthly lifetime, uh, Jesus would know many Marys. His mother Mary, Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, Mary Magdalene. She was engaged, or better, betrothed to a carpenter, we find that out later, named Joseph. The established custom for marriage at the time was for the arrangement to be made soon after puberty, so Mary was probably a girl in her very early teens. Uh, the betrothal was a stronger arrangement than our Western concept of engagement, engagements as we all know, sometimes fall out and don't happen after all. 
But the Jewish betrothal was legally binding. Uh, the couple was pledged to marry, except that marital relations were strictly prohibited until the actual marriage took place. Only divorce or death could undo the arrangement, and in the case of the latter of death, that girl would be considered a widow. Joseph is said to have been of the descendants, or literally house of David. That will be important uh, to the announcement Gabriel will soon make in verses 32 and 33, an obvious reference to the Davidic covenant made centuries before and recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7, in which God had promised David, who had misguidedly wanted to build a house for the Lord, a temple for the Lord, that it would instead be he who would build the house. He would build the house for David, and it would be a house that would endure forever. Later in chapter 3 in Luke's genealogy, he will identify Jesus as being thought of as the son of Joseph. In Matthew's genealogy, in his first chapter, Joseph is described as the husband of Mary by whom Jesus was born. And both of those comments indicate that Jesus was judged to have been born from the royal line because Joseph was a direct descendant of David, and Jesus was considered his legal son uh, by right of adoption. But it is the angel's greeting to Mary that begins the wonder. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. We don't have to imagine the effect Gabriel's greeting had on her, for Luke tells us in in his next breath, but we should take note of what exactly she heard. What did Mary hear? Favored one, the Lord is with you. Those two go together. Uh, The favor had come from the Lord. Uh, Nothing is, is said of anything she had done in her short life to deserve this favor. In fact, In verse 30, look there please, in verse 30, he expands the thought, Mary had found favor from God. She was especially favored in that God had already chosen her to bring his own son into the world. And if that sounds familiar, found favor, it's because it's the biblical idea of grace. We love grace at Believer's Chapel. Here is grace. Grace is unmerited favor. So you're not surprised to discover that both words are from the same Greek word as Greek root as grace, charis. We have people here named charis. It's the same word Paul used in his breathless introduction to the epistle to the Ephesians in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, God adopted us into his family, Paul says to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely graced on us in the Beloved. That's my my translation. Mary is favored because she is the recipient of God's grace. Now, sadly, as, as history unfolded, Jerome would publish the Latin translation of the Bible, the Vulgate, And his translation of this verse would be the now familiar, Hail Mary, full of grace. Uh, Soon the idea became accepted that Mary was full of grace in the sense that she had plenty enough to spread around. And you could actually pray to her to dispense some of that grace. And then later, uh, fast forward a a few centuries, and a certain quarterback believed that it was his own Hail Mary uh, that ensured that the pass would be caught by Drew Pearson to beat the Minnesota Vikings. I'm not sure he really believed that, but he he said that. He said a Hail Mary. The reputation of the Cowboys has fallen so much, that doesn't work anymore. 
course, there's age to consider too, but the true sense was Mary was full of grace because she had received it from God who was with her and who had chosen her to be the mother of the Messiah. You and I are like Mary. We may never obtain any kind of notoriety in our life and the social circles that we're in, uh, in our, even in our own church. Uh, we may not get the same respect in our own family that we feel like we uh, deserve, uh, but we have been chosen uh, to serve the Lord, and it's only because of found grace. It's only the unmerited favor of God that has us here today and has us in the neighborhoods and family gatherings and in the marketplace to shine the light of Christ and be a witness for him. Apart from God's grace, we are lowly, nameless, poor sinners, muddling our way through life with no understanding of God or of what his plan is for us. Mary was a sinner, and she needed a Savior. She will confess it herself uh, in her beautiful song, rejoicing in God her Savior. We are like Mary, to whom an angel paid a visit this day with a message of grace from God. But actually, Mary at first was quite perplexed at the angel's message, according to Luke, he writes that she kept pondering what kind of situation, salutation this was. Now, we can read too much into this. After all, who wouldn't be startled? Who wouldn't be arrested by the face of a, a, a sudden personal appearance of a supernatural being? Perplexity, perhaps, is putting it mildly, but clearly... It was the words of the angel that provoked her wonder. We discover here that Mary was a thoughtful person, not shallow at all, and it was her own admirable modesty that moved her to pause and reflect. Later in the Magnificat, it's, uh, it's right across the page here in my Bible, uh, in verse 48, she will admit to her humble state. And in verse 52, wonder in amazement at how the mighty God had exalted her. Mary was properly meek. Uh, we remember this blessing from God that is to characterize a, a disciple of Christ. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the king, the, the, they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is that attitude of mind and heart that admits to no sense of entitlement or merit, but instead marvels that another would extend any favor to them at all. That was Mary. And she will sing in wonder in the Magnificat at, at how from this time on all generations will count her blessed. That's the beatitude, blessed. And we do. Uh, not because of anything intrinsically of merit in Mary herself, but because God chose her to be an especially exalted servant. Now, we believe that the Roman Catholic theology concerning her status is misguided and that Mary should not be the object of our worship or are considered the purveyor of blessing. At the same time, we ought not abandon one error, error only to embrace another. Mary deserves our admiration, and I, I say this with caution, even our envy. She was blessed by God. She was the mother of the Son of God. Luther captured that thought, writing, Oh, Mary, you are blessed. You have a gracious God. No woman has ever lived on earth to whom God has shown such grace. You are the crown of them all. And so in verse 30, the angel responds, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And then in verses 31 through 33, he provides 
the substance of that favor. And if she was perplexed before, now it's safe to say, I think she was shocked. Shocked. The virgin would conceive and bear a son. And she would, was to name him uh, Jesus. The announcement was an almost verbatim quotation from the Greek translation of Isaiah 7.14. And with this audience, that rings a bell with you immediately. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, of course, means God with us. The angel had already told Mary that God was with her. Now she knew how powerfully present he was with her. She was the virgin of Isaiah 7, 14. Emmanuel would be her son, and he would bear a human name, Jesus. And I know you're thinking, you know, Matthew added something in his gospel account that Luke somehow has omitted, uh, either as an editorial comment, you go back and look at that passage in Matthew chapter 1, either as an editorial comment or the angel uh, actually said it, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The, the name Jesus was, was common to the period. It was not an unusual name at all. It was the Greek form of the Hebrew Joshua, and it meant the, the Lord is Savior, or the Lord saves. His name would be Jesus, in other words, because he was destined to be our Savior. But that was not all. Gabriel continued his announcement, the child will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And so like Zacharias, before her, Mary is told that her miracle child will be great. But John the Baptist's greatness would be a derivative greatness bound up in his witness to the one who would come after him. And he would one day testify to that, you remember, saying, after me, one is coming who is mightier than I, and I'm not able, I'm not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. But the greatness of the announced child to be born of Mary is bound up in the lofty title given to him. If his name, Jesus, held deep meaning, the title now given indicates his true being. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of the Most High. I'm sure it took some time for the gravity of this announcement to fully penetrate Mary's consciousness, but uh, this part of it she grasped. She was to be the mother of the Son of God. Her child would be God's son. But the angel didn't stop there. This son would assume the role of the long-awaited Messiah. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And I mentioned at the beginning the significance of Joseph being of the house of David. Uh, Old Testament passages such as 2 Samuel 7 and Psalm 2 uh, pointed to a coming Messiah who would, in a unique sense, be not only the son of David, but also the very son of God. Uh, both passages emphasize a future son, father-son relationship involved in David's promised descendant. In verse 13 of 2 Samuel 7, for example, God informs David, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. 
And then in Psalm 2, Psalm 2 is a Psalm of David. It, it doesn't say that, but it, from Acts chapter 4, we find out it's a, a Psalm of David. And in it, David, in prophetic fashion, describes the relationship between the Lord and his anointed. That is, between God and his son, the Messiah, whom David understands is that future descendant of him, of his, promised by the Lord. The nations are in an uproar, he says. The kings of the earth take their stand against the Lord and against his anointed. But he who sits in the heavens laughs. It's one of, one of our favorite psalms, isn't it? He who sits in the heavens laughs. And then he speaks. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. And then the sun speaks. It's a marvelous psalm. Uh, the sun speaks. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. These two great Old Testament passages testifying to this great truth of an eternal son of God who would uh, have a kingdom and reign forever. And so the author of Hebrews, sorry to keep doing this to you, but you got two Old Testament passages, 2 Samuel 7 and Psalm chapter 2. The author of Hebrews would eventually, in his introduction, in, in the very beginning, in verse 6 of, of chapter 1, uh, would quote from both of those Old Testament passages, writing, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? To none of the angels did he say that. And again, now from 2 Samuel, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Gabriel seems to be saying to Mary, First, the child will be the son of God, and in that capacity as the Son of God, he will serve as the promised Son of David, the Messiah. And of course, saying that God will give him that throne, it follows that his kingship will be forever and his kingdom will have no end. That too was a provision of the covenant that God had made with David. So back to Mary. This was a lot to, to take in. She was going to get pregnant. The baby's name was already determined for her. Somehow he would be God's son and not just hers. And he would be the promised Messiah. What an amazing turn of events. Perhaps the most amazing <laughs> turn of events ever. But she couldn't even get over the first part, and so she asked Gabriel the obvious question, how can this be since I am a, a virgin? I have not known a man sexually, is what she was saying. She had taken biology class, perhaps, and being facetious, and, and so she knew enough to know that this was an impossibility. Now, some have thought her question strange. Follow me here. After all, she was betrothed, and she was to be married to Joseph, so the two of them would soon consummate their marriage, and eventually she would conceive. That's the way life goes. The most likely answer was that she had caught that reference to Isaiah 7, 14 and understood the angel to be saying she was to fulfill the prophecy that a virgin would conceive and bear a son. She was that virgin. So back to the question, how can this be? Gabriel's response in verse 35 is at once both wonderful and impenetrable. The angel answered 
and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Mary's conception and eventual childbirth would come about apart from any human agency. It would be a supernatural conception. The activity of God's Spirit. Doesn't that sound like how God would do something? The Spirit would come upon Mary. The power of the Most High would overshadow her. And so we focus on those two actions. What do they mean? We dismiss immediately any crude suggestion that this is some kind of divine begetting that the angel is talking about. The coming upon, the angel describes, is the same verb used of the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost when he suddenly filled the house where they were sitting with his presence and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus had promised that experience in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. He said, you will, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And this overshadowing, the next phrase that he describes, is the same action of God described of his presence resting on the tabernacle in the, in the cloud. That's in Exodus 40, verse 35. The picture is of God at work in his own mysterious way. And I would ask you, hasn't that been our own experience? We've received our own new birth in much the same way as this by the invisible power of the Holy Spirit, giving us new life, regenerating us? Where did it come from? Jesus with Nicodemus talked about the wind. It, it, it comes, it goes, we don't know how or why, so is the Spirit. That which is born of the Spirit, is, it, it, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. We are new creatures in Christ, solely on account of the invisible work of God's Spirit in our lives. And if you don't believe that, not a challenge, but if you don't believe that, then you've got a lot of learning to do. I think everybody in here does believe that. And so it was with Mary. God could accomplish in her whatever he desired. Uh, but then the angel, his mission accomplished... And without being asked by Mary for any kind of confirming sign, offers her one anyway in verse 36. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. The fact of Elizabeth's pregnancy... Uh, now in her sixth month was an encouraging and gracious token to Mary that the announcement she had just received was possible after all. Elizabeth was proof that when God is at work, nothing is impossible with him. Perhaps Gabriel had in mind uh, the miracle with Sarah, etched in every pious Jew's mind. Centuries before, remember, Sarah had laughed when the visitor had said that this time next year I'm going to come back. And the barren and aged Sarah would have a son. Uh, Sarah was like Elizabeth, barren and, and too old, and she didn't believe it could be true. And the visitor challenged her, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Nothing is. Nothing is too difficult, so we never stop praying. We never despair when it seems our hopes and our desires are hopelessly impossible. Nothing is too hard for God. I know, looking at, at, around this room, that every single one of us has something that we're praying for every day. 
every day. And we have been. Well, we have been for years. Nothing is impossible with God. So we don't despair. We know that and we keep praying. Well, Luke's account of the Annunciation of the Christ concludes with Mary's humble submission. One writer called it her quiet heroism. She was not yet married, betrothed, but not yet in an accepted position to be found pregnant. Yet Mary says to the angel, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Mary was a woman of faith. Her conduct and her response speak loudly to it, and and surely she serves as a model for each of us to submit ourselves to the Lord's will for us, no matter where that might take us. That's the reality of it. We don't know, we don't know where God's will for us will take us. But one thing we do know, it is the perfect place. It's the safest place and the place that promises the greatest rewards. It may not seem like it at the time, but it is the place that God has for us. And so may the Lord increase our faith that more and more We may be able to respond, may it be done to me according to your word. Another way of saying that, may it be done to me according to your will, O holy, loving, righteous God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you sent the angel uh, that day. Uh, He entered into time and space, the time and space that we Uh, inhabit. And he appeared to this woman, a real flesh and blood young virgin with a name, uh, Mary. And you announced uh, the greatest thing, that you were sending your son into the world. That's why we're here today, Lord, humbly uh, before you, it's because you, you sent your son into the world and you sent him into our hearts. Uh, you gave us, you came upon us uh, and you, you, you brought new life to us and you gave your son to us by your spirit and we praise you for that. What, what a blessing. Lord, may we be so filled with gratitude that we live lives dedicated to you. Uh, May it be done to us according to your perfect will. We pray that today. Lord, we pray for those again, as we did at the beginning, those in our assembly, in our body, who are uh, going through particularly difficult times, and for those who serve them and stand beside them, we ask your blessings, uh, blessings of comfort and peace and healing. For Christ's sake, amen.